it's Jeremy back with another edition of Abolitionist Abstractions. As I mentioned in the last episode, I was going to try to get a lot more conversations going this year with the show. And uh, instead of just having me doing monologues and stuff like that, which I'll still throw a bunch of those in there, but I was looking to actually get out and talk to people. And since I put that episode out, I've actually received quite a number of responses. I was actually kind of overwhelmed. I wasn't expecting to hear from that many people so quickly. I was like, this is great. And the first person who actually contacted me, I have with me tonight. And this is this is Ryan from the Wasp Rep- Wasp Report podcast, right? This that's your show. Uh, yeah, that's me. My name is Ryan. I'm also known as uh, the Wasp. I am uh, a very alt right, pro Trump, anarcho capitalist. Uh, that's how I've uh, branded myself. Uh, many people seem to uh, disagree <laughs> the, that I'm an anarcho capitalist. I've I've been kicked out of basically every anarcho capitalist uh, group on Google Plus <laughs> and Twitter over the course of my uh, trolling and my participation in the Great Meme War of uh, 2016. But yeah, I decided to uh, start this show not simply just to be a contrarian, like many people think I am, or a troll, but because I believe that I my ideas have the ability to bridge the gap uh, between several different right-wing, liberty-minded ideologies that are very close to one another but can't seem to stop fighting. You know, so that's basically what uh, my show about. And, and otherwise, being uh, semi-pro Trump, you know, when I like him, some days I like him, some days I don't. But <laughs> you know how that is. Is it okay if I plug a plug a couple? Oh, of things? absolutely. I'm. Uh, I'll let you. I mean, I'll let you plug at the end too. But sure, feel feel free to plug whatever you want. Okay, yeah, so my website is thewaspreport.com, where you can go there and listen to all of my episodes. On my website, you can sign up for my mailing list. Uh, You can also uh, donate to me uh, Bitcoins. Uh, I have my Bitcoin wallet up there. I accept Bitcoin Cash. I accept uh, Omision Go, Dash, Monroe Coins, Litecoins, and uh, basically everything in Exodus Wallet ports uh, you can put in there. Also, I'm selling uh, official Wasp Report t-shirts on teespring.com. Just go to teespring.com slash the Wasp Report and get an official wasp report uh, t-shirt and uh yeah that's it for plugs <laughs> thanks all right yeah no problem man well yeah like i said uh you uh, you reached out to me after i put that episode out and i mean uh, as i was telling you before we before we started the show uh, I honestly, you know, I, I didn't know anything about you. I, I don't, I hadn't even recalled seeing the name before, but I, I, you know, you said, check out one, check out some of your podcasts and get back to you. So I sat right, I sat down like an hour later and I had the chance to listen and I, I listened to most of the most recent podcast. And when it comes for, for me, number one, the most important thing is audio quality. Uh, Michael Dean at the Freedom Fiends has beaten that into my head over the years. So that is why I'm, my, my first and foremost uh, goal is always to strive for good audio quality. So when I listen to the show, I'm like, Hey, you sound pretty good so this is already a good start and then you mentioned in the yeah. note that you wrote me that you know we you, you. you we may disagree uh on some on some things and obviously with the the position with the uh the way you identified yourself i could see i could see why we would probably disagree on some things but that actually was perfect for me because these are the type of conversations i like to have i don't you know i i said ever since dave and danilo and i originally started the seeds of liberty way back in the beginning of 2015 my goal for our show, for uh, the uh, the company group and page and everything was to never create an echo chamber. I didn't want that because I had been in too many of those mm-hmm. before and I wanted to keep it open. I, I didn't want it to be like all the other anarchist groups or whatever or followings that kind of just create and just naturally fall into you know the, tr- the tribal stuff and everybody just kind of blots out everything else and you end up for you know for lack of better terminology you end up being no better than the status sometimes you know <laughs> like it's, yeah you- and and uh speaking speaking of echo chambers you know i just want to point out that my biggest gripe uh with the community is that uh they tend to get hung up on like one or two issues i mean i remember back in 2015 there was a big hang up especially with the uh new hampshire sort of uh movement that happened uh, in 2015, uh, there was a big debate about abortion, and that separated a lot of people. And then in 2016, the debate was between anarchists and minarchists. And then Christopher Cantwell went full blown Nazi, and then Trump got elected. So I mean, there's just been like these divisive <laughs> things that keep happening in the liberty community. And at sometimes it seems like the liberty community is getting stronger, and then sometimes like I have serious doubts because of the 
prevalent autism that exists like it with the audiences they get so angry at each other and they can't they can't communicate anymore to po point in case i just watched a shane killian video uh critiquing sticks hex and hammer and i i was like so disappointed like another one of my heroes again resorting to ad hominem attacks you know what i mean and and then the other big disappointment i had for 2018 so far was when I watched the debate between it was on the Warski channel you may have seen this but it was uh, Richard Spend Spencer uh, having a debate with Sargon of Akkad and which are two people I greatly respect and just have them both just devolve into ad hominem attacks and like just are completely speaking different language languages or like what Scott Adams uh, likes to say uh, we're all watching the same screen but we're seeing different movies if that makes sense. No, it does. I, I, I would agree with that assessment too, because it, 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 it does seem to happen. And I mean, I, I've joked about it in the past. I was actually serious about it for a while. I think I may be getting serious about it again though, because what, what I see with that is the, the term I use for it. And like I said, it's, it's used half jokingly, but it's, it's like this residual statism, but that gets that you see that a lot of people who come to the Liberty community or whatever you want to call it and kind of find their way over here, there seems to be a, a certain path that only a couple of people, I mean, everybody makes their own path, right? I, I don't want to like say there's only one path, but like there seems to be only a certain group. Mine was weed. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Mine was weed. That, it was that, just a hundred percent weed. Like, listen, if the government would just let me smoke weed, I would have never become an anarchist. I would never <laughs> even known about anarcho-capitalism. I would never, like the thought would never occur to me to abolish the government. If I could just like, Get a nine to five job and smoke reefer once in a while. <laughs> well, that did play a big role for me, but I don't know if it was the only reason. Uh, but yeah, the, the, I mean, I like to think I've evolved past that now. But like in the beginning, I no. mean, that was the main motivation. I gotta be honest. Well, no, that's that's fine. I mean, I, it was like I said, it was part of it for me too. But it, I mean, everybody has their own the path. But what I was trying to get to is that every it seems that only a, a small number of the of of the small number of people who make it through the over you know over the over the fence originally kind of continue trying to learn where everybody uh, uh, it's not everybody but the majority of other people seem to hop over the fence call either call themselves an anarchist or think they're an anarchist or, or start to have start to agree with a lot of uh, you know more libertarian or, or anarcho-capitalist principles or whatever it is and but then they stop they just stop right there and they're like oh I found now I found the answer and they just become very defensive about that position, and it's no it's it's no different than watching so-called debate between any other political party, especially here in the United States. It's this it's the same type mm -hmm. of thing. That's that's why I back. You know, you were talking about being kind of banished from all the uh, anarcho-capitalist groups. I got banished from most of them as well. Every single one. Yeah. I, I got banished from most of them as well, but for for different reasons than you did. But the ones that I remained in, most most of the other groups, <laughs> I just left because I had no interest in even trying to have discussions with most of these people anymore because it never seemed to go anywhere because they were still so the first one go ahead the first time i got kicked out of an ancap group is when i said that i was sympathetic to israel that was uh not not taken very well <laughs> And, uh, and then the, the second in what, time, in uh, what sense though? Well, well, I, well okay. Fin finish that, but I want to get back to this. That I, I'm interested in that in, in your sympathies towards oh, Israel, yeah. but like, yeah, sure. Go ahead. And the, I mean, I, I just find myself like, uh, I, I guess I just have like a really conservative bias, I guess, and it might be genetic. Who knows? Um, my fan, but my family certain, I certainly wasn't raised in a conservative environment. You know, my family is a bunch of liberals. Uh, so the second time I got kicked out of an ANCAP group is when I told them I was pro-life, uh, which I still am. And then the last time I got kicked out was uh, when I voted for Trump. No, no, no. That was the second last time. When I voted for Trump, I got kicked out. <laughs> and then recently I was in the Cool Capitalist Kids on Twitter. Shout out to you guys. Love you all. But they kicked me out because uh, there because I was arguing with everybody about border walls, but not really. I was more like just like making a little comment here or there and trolling people. But yeah, they actually let me back in, so <laughs> I'm cool with them. Oh, well, that was nice of them. Well, see, that's that's actually 
I do still want to get back to this Israel thing, but that, that the last point that you just made, it's it's funny because that's part of I think that's part of at least what I what I'm seeing, what we were just talking about, where where everybody is still like uh, you know, arguing with each other over these stupid things because that's what it or or devolving, you know, the the so called debates devolve into ad homs right away. It's that same type of thing where people just you 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 can tell you can test them out easily enough by just doing a slight bit of trolling and you watch the reactions from people and like mm-hmm. the visceral just immediate emotional responses from from these individuals and it, it to me it's especially the, the further and further i've drifted away from the uh, label of of uh, of ancap even though i still hold many of the ideals and i'd still probably like mm-hmm. fit closest under that ideology on other than any other it's it's just i've 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 found it uh, entertaining to poke fun at a lot of them and it's just it's for me it's it's the funniest with them because they and i know for, at least for me when uh when i was a hardcore ancap and and kept spread and kept trying to spread the message everywhere it was the whole the whole reason i knew i recognized that i got there was because of the whole logic and reason thing and it's like well we're the we're the masters of logic because we we actually figured all this stuff out and we actually look at things logically and that's yeah. why we understood that the state is the state actually, is immoral i actually hate that word what's that logic <laughs> i hate that i hate that word logic yeah 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 it is, it i also hate the word i also hate the word principles i mm. really hate that word and Good I time. also, because to me, uh, those two things are equivalent to the word science. I also hate the word science because they're, they're things that aren't what they are. You know what I mean? Like the word logic is not logic. The word science is not science, but people will add it to the end of sentences like this. It's logic or it's science or it's principles, you know, just saying the word, but mm-hmm. being uh, devoid of the actual meaning of it. You know what I mean? Sure. Like when you sit there and make a really great argument about why the whole hoobla around climate change might be a little bit blown out of proportion and you present evidence and you present some facts and you present some economic concerns and then you're told that you're anti-science. It's like, <laughs> what? You just <laughs> like, did you not just hear what I've been saying for the past 20 minutes? Like, I'm anti what? <laughs> you're, you're anti their version of science. Well, no, I I can understand right, that exactly. though, because but that I mean, that is unfortunately the the overarching culture we seem to live under right now. It's you know I've I've called it the meme and Twitter generation, and I'm not just talking about the latest generation. It's everybody who's alive right now who has access short to attention these spans. Yeah, oh yeah, horrible. Spans. They they continue to they continue to decrease by the day, and and sometimes I I, I I've posited and I'm mostly serious that I think it's largely by design because it fits right in with everything else with the Prussian school model and all that. But it, it's just that people, everybody has their, you know, like I was saying before, people just have their minds made up, whatever, whatever their ideology is their you know, it's the whole identity politic thing. Everybody, everybody is attached to that I, I, ideology and they, they make it their identity. So, and they don't have to look any further. They have the answers. So, so all they have to do to short cir- or, or attempt to short circuit somebody like you, who's actually going to try to provide a, an actual argument for whatever it is, is to throw out buzzwords. You know, it's it's no different than somebody than a, a liberal calling somebody a racist for whatever they say, or you know, whatever, whatever it is, yeah. any term like it. it's it's all the same thing, and because they can just go, oh, yeah. well, it's not this, or you're this, it's like. No, I don't. I don't. I, if, you know, it's it's one of those things where the that uh, Anigo Montoyo meme should be on hand at all times. You know, you keep using that word. I don't. Think I don't you think know, that means what you, you think, think it means. Exactly. You should you should always have that meme on hand to talk to try to converse with most of these people because that's what it boils down to is they they don't understand the very language that they're using. Inconceivable. <laughs> Uh, that is one of the uh, that is one of my favorite movies of all time. I don't. I don't, I don't oh, it's a great movie. Yeah, it's, it's... I recently, and by recently, I mean last year. I actually sat my wife down for the first time uh, to watch uh, Princess Bride, and after the movie was over, she was like, "Why do you Why do you like this movie? This movie's terrible. <laughs> it's old." Yeah. You know, but she's she's actually an immigrant, so she just doesn't understand American culture. So I don't know. 
Well, I don't even. I don't uh, even. But, I, I mean, that's that's funny, but I don't even think necessarily it matters if she's an immigrant or not. Like you know, no, any, it does any, because any, she shows me things from her childhood, and it's just as alien to me. As, uh, well, no, I was gonna say because it's it's also the same thing with like anybody who wasn't. I think that's one of those movies that you really have to have been around when it came out to appreciate it, because anybody you have to have like childhood memories like attached to it to get the emotional value. Yeah, because otherwise, otherwise it's it's like pretty much anything else. You look into this, and you especially after watching movies in this day and age and you're just like well this is absolute crap what the hell is this it's, it, a, stu- it it's a stupid it, love story whatever right yeah ew they're kissing uh but it, it helps if you binge watch wonder years before you watch the movie that's yes, it that will help <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. Um, but yeah, I just I want again back to what we were talking about, uh, just about political ideologies and stuff. I just want to uh, say that uh, when it comes to uh, political labels, I hold on to my my political labels very jealously. You know, I'm I'm very attached to them, and I think it's important to my identity to actually be that way. Like, uh, no matter how many times people will say that I'm not really an anarcho capitalist. I will never stop calling myself that. And no matter how many people on the alt-right say that, oh, you're a cock or you're autistic or you're not really an alt-right guy, I'll, I'm never going to let go of that label either. You know, those labels belong to me. They're mine. And maybe that's not something you understand, to quote character in an Ayn Rand book. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, those labels are mine, and uh, I will not give them up. And uh, the reason I feel that way is because I was deeply inspired, and this might trigger some people out there, because I've yet to been able to really express this on my show, but one of my biggest inspirations was actually Christopher Cantwell. And the reason why was because I felt that out of all the personalities that I was listening to at the time, he was the one that I felt was most articulate when it came to explaining the non-aggression principle. And because of that, I kept listening to them. But then I watched him transform into something that I thought was completely different from libertarianism. And in a lot of ways, I still do. I mean, that's that he went to uh, crazy town, you know. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he always maintained that he wasn't breaking the non-aggression principle. He always maintained his adherence to it you know as crazy and as pinochet-esque as he got you know and for that and i think that to me shows the flexibility of ideas and that i think that if christopher cantwell can can reach out to white supremacists and make them think about economics right what the heck is our excuse (laughs) <laughs> what the heck is our excuse when normal libertarian party people and anarcho capitalists and like Trump people can't even have a conversation? You know, what is our excuse? Well, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, with using, using, using Cantwell as the specific example, I think, I think for a lot of people, uh, it may come down to one of those words that you, you're not a big fan of, uh, like principles, because you have in order, in, <laughs> in order, in order, in order to do that. I mean, and I mean, I've talked about this on other shows before and, and it, yeah. gets, it gets brought up on the fiends a lot because, because my, Michael loves to bring it up, uh, when I'm on with him. Now, let, let me be clear. Let me be clear. I, strongly believe in principles it's no, the you word just, principles no no i know i i, I would just I would, I would just poke it fun at you i know i know i knew what you meant so that's that's fine yeah. man I, I get you but he uh i you know we, it, it gets brought up a lot but like i knew the guy in real life because he he comes from my neck of the woods here on long island and i got yeah, to ha- new york yeah. i got to hang out with him a couple of times before he finally headed up, that must have been insane. Before, well, no, because back in the was, day like, he was ba- drugs and back stuff. Back in the day he was, you know, he was crazy, but he wasn't, you know, he he didn't have he didn't have the Nazi he didn't have the Nazi streak in him. Although the although a, a racist side of him always did seem to be kind of present, but I like I didn't know him well, and <laughs> en- I didn't know him well enough. I knew him like I like I said, I hung out with him a couple of times, and I, I knew him through other people. But in order to do the things that he did and make those connections. He, what in some people's eyes, I think he definitely had to stretch those those so-called principles. And and I'll agree with you that I think he has always, at least, he's always claimed and he he truly believes that he has adhered to the nap. And I think he he may he may very well have in a lot of situations too. But 
for for me, I, I think uh, it comes down to at least uh, at least I know when I started to to walk away from him originally was when he got really hell bent on the you know taking the nap to the extreme. I guess is the I, I hate to use that phraseology, but that uh, you know the paperclip thing, like that was his whole thing. That you know, there's there's been memes mm-hmm. and jokes about that ever since. But it was kind of it was that mentality that that you know you steal my paperclip. Wait, what I was can, the paper? What was the paperclip thing? Refresh my memory. That that basically, if you if somebody steals his paperclip, then that's a nap violation, and he can kill them. Oh right, right, right. You okay. know, and you know when you have yeah. when you're looking at it through that lens, sure, it's really hard to break the goddamn mm-hmm. nap. But again, yeah. as, as we were talking but, about as we were talking about pre-show, I have drifted slightly uh i think I, I i like to call it evolving continually evolving with my ideas and and where i where i stand on a lot of things and i don't throw the, like i don't put the nap front and center anymore as this as this absolute that uh you know everything like it all comes down to this and like i don't make those i don't even make arguments for certain things anymore but i although you know because i'm i'm still coming to new ideas and and kind of mulling things over in my head right now which is why like I understand what you were saying before about you know clinging jealously to your to the labels that you choose for yourself like that's great I get that and I have no problem with that uh, for me I don't I'm not one of those people like I don't like labels like no no that's I'm not like that at all I just I don't really have one well, of, necessarily. Course, of course people don't like labels because uh, what happens with labels is labels is shorthand for your entire identity and belief system so what happens when you attach a label to yourself is that you make yourself vulnerable so it's perfectly natural for somebody not to like labels but i think the important thing is that we don't let other people uh, i mean define us if we don't let other people define us and we def- instead define ourselves then we're in a much stronger position whether we like labels or not oh no absolutely i and i, I agree with that and like i would just i would just kind of poke in fun at the people that are so pretentious about it that like that i don't do labels or i don't believe in labels like that yeah because yeah. i because because I, I agree I, I think they are important uh, you know, for certain, for certain. And what reasons. I was trying to say is that uh, when people say uh, I don't like labels, uh, they don't like labels because they're weak. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, good point. Because they're weak. <laughs> I'll they're take scared. that. Uh, but yeah, no. So, but my whole like, so I'm not, I'm not at that. I, I don't take it to that extent. I just don't have one necessarily at the moment because I'm still learning. I'm still coming to new ideas and 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 learning more stuff and trying to stay open. You know, I think the the close like the only the only thing I give myself if I if if somebody if, you know tries to pin me down and says you know basically you have to give me a label. It's like well, all right, I'm an individualist anarchist if anything currently. You know, but I just have my own ideas about things. You know, so I I have. I, I still think, you know, like I said, we were talking about pre-show. I still think the nap is a great idea. I still think as a prince, as, as a <laughs> principal, I still think it holds and, you know, it, it's a great way to try to form a society. I just think when it comes to somebody like Chris, he may, he just views it in a different way that I do. So he can continue mm-hmm. to say that he's within his bounds, but I've also found, especially in the past year or so that I've, I've kind of put the brakes on things and took a step back and tried to uh, do some more soul searching and kind of reassess where I was yeah. uh, amongst the, amongst so, the, so this is, well, hold on, this let me is just, actually one on. of the, let me just, let me, okay, just, let me just finish this. You know, being that locked down to something, uh, it kind of kind of lets you open to uh, blind spots. I think you were making that point before, and then it ends up, you know, a lot of people were making the argument to me originally when I was pumping the nap, 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 that you know the thing, the idea about like gray areas, or you know, like if it's mm-hmm. you know le- le- like yeah. legitimately, well, there are certain situations like you know you're going to violate it, even even though, even though it does because you're put it like if somebody gives you these lifeboat scenarios, well, yeah, you may have to whatever, but. I think, yeah. you know, I used to like just shrug those off as, as if it was, no, this is an absolute and you know, you're wrong. And now I look at it well, like, well, I kind of understand where some of these people are coming from. So anybody who still like holds it is like, well, everything I'm doing is under the nap. Like to me, I'm just like, I don't like, that's not enough for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> like you got to give me more. And I think yeah. Chris went off the rails in a lot of other ways. Um, although I will say I've, I always enjoyed his writing. You know, I, I enjoyed his, his speeches uh, back when he actually used yeah to his write. writing's incredible he, you know? he, I love it when he writes something and then speaks it that, that's the best I I mean I personally probably wouldn't want to necessarily hang out with Chris Cantwell because I'd be scared for my safety but uh, <laughs> 
but yeah, I think his writing's fantastic. But but I, what I wanted to say was like this whole thing with like the nap is it absolute? Is it not? And, and these sort of um, these life raft scenarios, as you put it, are actually something that I've heavily wrestled with in my own private time. And I do actually feel that this is one of the places where I feel that I can bridge the gap between uh, how the non-aggression principle works and to the normies in the rest of the world. And I think a great way is, and one of the reasons I want to talk about Christopher Cantwell, let's go back to the whole paperclip scenario, right? So think of the non-aggression principle like one side of a mirror, one side of a black mirror, if you will. Just No, I'm just being cheeky. Um, <laughs> I just, I just binge watch Black Mirror, so I'm just like all about that show right now. <laughs> so think of the non-aggression principle as one side of a mirror right when you make a violation of the non-aggression principle when you initiate force against someone who is not using force against you you like sort of like pass through that mirror and once you pass through that mirror that's when you're in the gray area as you call it right where someone like christopher cantwell says i have the right to kill you and somebody else says well no you don't that's that area that's on the other side of the mirror that you can't see because you're on the nap side when you're not violating the nap you can't see past that mirror so so what these two realms are uh and they've talked about this a lot in, in philosophy aristotle talked about this but there is this side of the mirror which is morality and then there's the other side of the mirror which is aesthetics and the other side of the mirror is not something that we can easily define. Like, we can't easily pick out which culture is better than any other. We can't easily figure out, uh, you know, if having sex before marriage is right or wrong, or if, if having abortions or, or whatever your, or gay marriage or, or whatever it is. Like, these are all aesthetic preferences. Should you throw commies out of helicopters or should you have open borders? I mean, the, like, these are, this is the, the realm of aesthetics the realm of minority uh, morality is black and white the realm of aesthetics is gray and unknowable that is why as an anarcho-capitalist i believe the, the only thing that can make sense of what is on the other side of that mirror is the free market it is the only thing that can sort things on the other side of the mirror in in not necessarily in a rational way but in a more rational way than someone who is deliberately trying to establish aesthetic preferences. The free market, through its just sheer volume of calculation, you know, almost like, almost like the way we a computer mines Bitcoin, the free market mines aesthetic preferences. So uh, just to make sure I, I have you, uh, I totally understand you here. So what you're kind of getting at is that even even the, the great you're referring to even like the gray area that could get sorted out in a in, in the market sense right like so 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 whether it's uh the whether it's cantwell's you can kill you can kill somebody over a paper clip or somebody who is more into like i guess proportionality the market will play mm -hmm. that out is that kind of what you're getting at on which well is, the which, market's which is the preferred? only thing that could play it out yeah okay no i'm i'm see again that's the only thing that can play it out that that to me that to me not only makes sense but I think it fits with my current understanding of things because like I said I've I've tried to step step away from absolutist positions largely as as much as I can um, because I keep getting reminded of how much I just don't fucking know and we all don't fucking know. Well, what I'm what I'm trying to remind you is that your positions don't matter. They absolutely don't matter because uh, the amount of info so. When you have p positions, right? When you have political positions, you, you, you've moved to the realm of aesthetic, aesthetics, right? And the what and w what you're doing is you're practicing pragmatism. You're with your political positions. What you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out what is the greatest amount of good that can be achieved for the greatest number of people, right? And the closer you get to that answer depends on how much information you have right but the problem with information which is necessary for markets to work it's necessary for people to function the better we can predict the future the more wealth we can generate so this information is necessary uh, however there's a near infinite 
amount of it. There's a near infinite amount of information out in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So the chances of you knowing uh, what is the greatest good for the greatest number of people is infinitesimally small, if not downright impossible. It is so impossible, in fact, that you would be better at guessing the greatest good for the greatest number of people than you were with as much information as you can possibly have. Like if you had no information at all and you were to just guess political positions, you would have a higher chance of being successful. And that's what the free market does. The free market is 7 billion people guessing this, the greatest outcome and having a better success rate, having a better hit rate than central planners doing it deliberately. And, th and this is why the free market can sort out these aesthetic preferences in this way and why we can't. Does that make sense? No, it does. No, it does. And, and like I said, I, I think it's, I, I've never, I don't think I've ever heard it explained that way. It's very interesting, uh, but I, it does, it does make sense. And I do understand, like I said, I think it fits. I, I think, you know, th this is one of those things, this, this is one of those bits of information that I've been picking up along the way over the past couple of years that I can plug in to what I have, what I have, what the understanding I have already and go, okay, I may be uh, stepping away from, uh, you know, this whole absolutist thing, uh, at least temporarily. But even then, like looking at that, it's like, okay, yeah, great. I put my, I, why, I, why not? I, t I tell people all the time in many other scenarios, almost you know, in, jokingly in that religious sense, it's like, well, you got to put your faith in the market because it will provide. Uh, it just, this is just another one of those scenarios that, yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think that's, uh, I think that's a good way. Well, a good no, way to see, look you at don't it. have to put faith in the market. I, you was, just I have to put doubt that. in yourself. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> it's very, no, very, very astute point. I, I was kidding, but that, uh, that make that puts a very fine point on it. That's, uh, that's true. Again, that, that's kind of yeah, it's, it fits it's, in with me because that's what I've been doing. I've been I've been realizing that I should be doubting myself more, <laughs> and uh, that's where mm -hmm. that's where I've gotten to where I am now. That's why I've explored all these other ideas. I mean, I've ex I've rejected just as many as I've continued learning about, but you know, at least I've been open to more of it now because I'm like, yeah, I don't know shit. <laughs> none of us know shit, but I know I I'm pretty sure none of us know shit. I know for a fact I don't know shit. Um, so I'm just gonna keep rolling with it. And hey, man, admitting that is the first step to wisdom. Exactly. Exactly. That's you know, what that's what Socrates said. Yeah. Admitting that you know nothing is the first step to wisdom. It, it all comes back to that. Yeah. And it, I, it, I don't care if I don't care if you're a pragmatist or if you're uh, what, what's the other one? Ontologicalist or, or I don't care if you're a collectivist or if you're an individualist. I, I don't think any of it matters. You know, I think that all paths kind of lead like when if you're if you're going up the mountain, you're all going to end up at the same place. Unless oh. you're a commie, then you're going down the mountain. <laughs> this is true. You're probably, if you're a commie, you're not going to get up the mountain unless somebody's actually going to carry your ass. Um, but that's, yeah, you're yeah. going the opposite way. <laughs> uh, but that's all right. Or, or you're just dead weight. <laughs> well, you know, somebody coming up, somebody coming up the mountain a little bit later than that commie is probably going to be hungry. So you know what? They're going to serve. They're going to serve. They're finally going to serve the greater good after all, because they're going to be a meal yeah. for somebody. So there you go. Hey, look, commies come in handy sometimes. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, I mean, it kind of it kind of stinks to realize that like your contribution to the world is kind of insignificant, and you're just kind of a cog in the machine, and and nothing you do really like matters long term, you know. But at the same time, it it's kind of liberating too uh, to realize that, and then what you can do is just try to figure out how to achieve your own happiness. And through achieving your own happiness, you actually assist in this greater good, whatever that ethic is, uh, in coming about uh, by just pursuing your own self-interest. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with that because that's actually uh, what happened, kind of what happened to me. You know, again, something we were talking about, I think, before the show about that whole, or, or I may have mentioned it now during the show, I don't even remember at this point, but that whole, the whole angry anarchist phase. Uh, when I when I first came when I first came to anarchism, the that I that I saw in so many other people after I finally stepped away from it, but that was kind of what that was kind of what got me out of it was kind of understanding that, you know what, I'm not going to see the the shit that I that I, the shit that I've been preaching about for the last year or whatever. I'm not going to see it in my lifetime. Like I'm not going to see this anarchist utopia that I've that I've been dreaming about. Like it's not like it's not feasible. Yeah. And let and and just in instead of that being crushing, 
it was like you, the word you used, it was, it was liberating. It really yeah. was like, I was able to open myself up to so much more after that. And then, and then do exactly what you were talking about with finding my own path to freedom and then just inadvertently helping others along the way, or, or actually from a capitalist perspective, it, it, it advertently helping people, you know, by pro, uh, providing products yeah. and services <laughs> that other people want. So yes, so I can get, so I can get, uh, get my wealth, like a greedy little capitalist, but in reality, what I'm actually doing is providing the good for the community that I, that I provide. Yeah. Your wealth, your wealth is a reflection of, uh, your service to others. Yeah. Exactly. So, so yeah, no, I, like I said, I totally agree with that. Cause that's, a, that's pretty much what happened to me a couple you know, after my first year or so in this and, uh, it all clicked together for me. And I was like, you know, and I would, when I would tell people that story, especially uh, people that were, you know, for lack of a better term, just still statists. And if I would have this conversation with them and they were like, you know, it, there, was, there was obviously some that would kind of, uh, you know, be like, oh, see, I told you, you know, it's, 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 you're, you know, you're never going to get there. But other ones that would actually want to have a conversation with about it would be like, well, mm -hmm. isn't that like kind of, you know, soul crushing? Like, here you go. This is what you've been working for. And now you've just realized it's not possible. Like, isn't that like, doesn't yeah. that, don't you feel defeated? I'm like, no, well, you know, I, I, I kind of have a sneaking suspicion that uh and kapistan as let's call the like our version of uh the promised land or heaven would be and kapistan yeah i i have a sneaking uh suspicion that like most religions <laughs> and kapistan is actually an impossible place to get to and in a way that's kind of the point you don't want to have an ideal that's uh easily achievable because then what would be the point what value would it create? Well, exactly. We'd, uh, we'd, we'd, we'd get there too quickly and everybody would get really lazy and then it would be destroyed in very <laughs> short order. And, uh, and, and again, all the things that the, the, the statists used to threaten in the arguments when I, back in the day when I used to still argue with them about, yo, even if you got, even if it happened, people would be clamoring for a government the next day. And it's like, yeah, well, probably. But you know what? It it, it it like I said, it it uh, it not only liberated me, but it also it gave me a renewed vigor for actually trying to pursue it. But more so for myself. And now, like I had my I had my young family at that point. You know, my girls were only like two years old yeah. when this happened, and I was like. Yeah. Screw it. I got, I got, I got, Congratulations, I, by I got, way. oh, thank you. I got, I, I got, I'm like, I got stuff to do here. I'm like, everybody else can worry about themselves. I'm going to still put out my content. I'm still going to do all this other stuff. I'll still try to, you know, for lack of a better term, reach people in some manner, but it's more so instead of trying to, instead of trying to preach to convert my, my methods have now mostly been more about just leading through example and trying to do certain things at least, at least, uh, you know, with my life, like, you know, how I ran my business for all those years. And now that I, now that I'm transitioning out of that and I've, you know, as I've talked about for the past couple of years now, uh, finally getting out of here and getting, getting out of the state and starting on my farm and stuff like that. It's just one of oh, those, nice. it's one of these, you know, I just want to put all of these, I want to put into practice all of these things that I've been talking about for years yeah. that I've, that I've said, you know, for the longest time, one of, one of my favorite lines that I originally heard from, I think I heard it from Kokesh and I don't even know if he, faith he might, without works is dead. Huh? Oh wait, no, that was Jesus. Sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> sorry. Wrong Jew. Yeah. He may, uh, he, he may have actually stolen this one. I have no idea, but I heard it from him first and it just made so much sense to me. And it was, it, it was his response to, uh, you know, to somebody to some status that he was talking to that was questioning him, uh, about how things would work. And it was, it was, you know, to paraphrase it, although I think this is pretty close. It was nobody, not, not me, not you, not anybody can tell you what what set what millions and possibly billions of people interacting voluntarily will ultimately look like and if they tell you that they can they're trying to sell you something yeah. because no yeah, none of definitely. us can possibly fucking know which goes back to the point you were making earlier like we we can't know this stuff there's certain things you, you just can't know right. and you just have you have to you know it you can't if if you fo if you try to focus on them too hard, then yeah, you're just gonna fuck yourself up. Either, you know, it's so much easier. I mean, it's just like anything else. Like it's, it's like you know the serenity prayer with AA and stuff like that. You know, accept the things you cannot change and be willing to change the things you can. Like there's a whole bunch of fucking things sure, in this yeah, world definitely. that you can't fucking change. You know, that's why like like so many people. Now, I, 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 would, I, I would go ahead. That kind of reminds me. Of the thing that first kind of like uh, made me think of this is uh, that guy T actually was the one that gave me the idea about the whole uh, mirror thing that I was just talking about because he in one of his videos and this is
was a long time ago. Uh, he said when asked about like either like the roads or like court system or like whatever how it would work in Ancapistan, he said in his video that he didn't know, and that that's the point. The point is that he doesn't know because uh, he, if he did know, then he wouldn't be making the case for anarchy. He would be making the case to uh, elect himself as a ruler. That I mean, if he were to claim that he knows how society should be, then you should make him the ruler because he has all the answers. But the point is, is that he doesn't know, and that's why he needs the free market to figure that stuff out for him. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I wholeheartedly And that's agree. why I think that guy T is one of the greatest YouTubers uh, ever. Love <laughs> I, I have not followed him much, but I, I know he was very pop. He's he's been very he's been popular for you know a couple of, couple of years now, I guess. Didn't he start out when he was like seventeen yeah, or eighteen yeah, he, or something? He, he was very posts young sporadically. He yeah, but he's he started out like really yeah, young, he right? Posts, he was only like eight, seventeen or eighteen yes, when he started posting. Yeah. yeah, so Yeah, he's a very young guy. Yeah. yeah. I, I know I know some people that, that have followed him that have said he kinda I, I get well. I don't know. You, you wouldn't have a problem with it, I guess. But you know, m my my friends that are, my my friends that are not uh, still in still in in Kapistan, the ones that have gone off in different directions, would refer to them as all those horrible alt writers and oh oh that guy T he went he went <laughs> with them and it's just like yeah you know what I think some of yeah. his stuff is trolling though I don't know I mean I don't know the guy personally I've never spoken to him but right but if I planted a flag and declared in Kapistan tomorrow, like you know they'd all come running. Of course they would. <laughs> Like actually, I, the, actually, like, I don't know, you know that. I don't know that because because honestly, most of the people, regardless of whether they're still in still in Ancapistan or think they want to be in Ancapistan or they're not, uh, most anarchists I know, and or most ones that have are either still attached to or at least or sometime were attached to the anarcho capitalist ideology are some of the worst capitalists I've ever met in my life. <laughs> they're horrible yes this is true like nobody like true, yeah. there's there's everybody i mean so many people are out there cyber begging i mean and i i say that of course full knowing full well yeah. that i accept donations on our show but that's not how we live like currently i only have a part-time yeah, job but that's but after on that's the other hand <laughs> on the other hand i know a lot of these guys were holding bitcoins and uh i'm pretty sure they bought themselves some pretty nice things for christmas so Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, no, there, there are factions of people that are now rich, but before that, but, but yeah, but, but a lot of those people, yeah. a lot of those people are just blind fucking lucky, you know, like, I, I mean, I, I, and I'm not, I'm not holding anything against them because any, anybody who got in, of course they're blind lucky, Jeremy, you know, but the, you know, there's no, cause there's, <laughs> that's what the market does. They just guess. They're just true. guessing. No. Okay. We, but I, I, okay. You're no, you're absolutely right. I, I should, I should actually, I should actually be more clear about that. I meant more so than the average person who's just guessing their way through things. Like people who have no idea about like the technology whatsoever uh -huh. that just kind of threw money in. It's like, Oh my God, I got all this money now. Yeah. There's a bunch but, of those people. But Jeremy, that's everybody. Well, no, there are people that are actually invest. There are, are people who actually study this stuff. And yes, are they still guessing? But there's uh -huh. two different levels. There is what I'm saying. They're no, there's not. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think we're going to differ on that I one because I think some people are a little no, more no, knowledgeable seriously. than others. I believe that Warren Buffett is on the same exact level of any other idiot teenager that went and bought a Bitcoin last year. Wow! Like they're just guessing. They're all just guessing. <laughs> Okay. Well, again, I, I think it's to, to a varying of degrees, but I guess if you're going to, if we're going to, if that's our only quibble, then I guess, we, I guess that's okay. <laughs> um, cause they are guessing. Well, I'm not mean, denying, hey, I'm not like, denying that. I'm not denying that they aren't guessing to some extent. How many absolutely. of these, how many of these multi-billionaires have gotten onto CNN and said, don't buy Bitcoin. It's going to pop. It's just a big bubble. It's a scam. It's a sham. It's a fraud. And, uh, they were wrong. They were wrong about that. Uh, a lot of these rich jerks got onto CNN and said in 2008 and said, hey, there's not going to be a housing bubble. So when they say there's not going to be a housing bubble, there is. When they say it, Bitcoin is a bubble, then it, then it isn't. It goes to the moon. So, I mean... Well, yeah, no, I'm, like, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with that either, although there are... They're just guessing. <laughs> yeah, no, okay, they're guessing, but there are a lot of those people, especially the ones who got on TV an awful lot, that were, were not only just guessing, but they, had, they actually had a vested interest in making sure that it, did, that it, that it gets destroyed. Um, you know, like right. people like Jamie Dimon, when he came out with his original fraud comment, which I'm, I'm actually... 
uh, you know, I have no respect for the man whatsoever, but I'm kind of, I, I, I'm kind of impressed that he actually walked that back a little bit. <laughs> um, I didn't think what, I would see. What did Jamie Diamond say? I don't even know ja- the guy. Jamie Diamond, the, the guy, for, for anybody who doesn't know, he's the, I guess he's the president or whatever, CEO maybe, I don't know, of, of JP Morgan or somebody high up over there, uh, whatever position, oh, right. whatever okay. position yeah. he holds over there. He made, like, I think it was about six months ago or something, he came out and, you know, said publicly, he used the word fraud in, 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 in regards to Bitcoin. Like he wasn't, I don't uh-huh. think he was, I think yeah. he was talking about crypto and in general, but he was specifically talking about Bitcoin, and he used the word fraud. And of course, the memes fraud, were yeah. plenty um, because you know, you know, he's talking about that, and all of us are looking at him, going like, "You're you're saying that with a straight face when you know you're somebody who backs the U.S. dollar right. because it helps you." <laughs> like fraud, I don't think you know. Right. Again, you know, calling that a Nigo Montoya meme, they. Uh, <laughs> He, well, uh, I mean, like someone like Scott Adams, someone like Scott Adams would say that the truth is that people aren't rational, you know, and I agree with that because I I believe that what people actually do is that they respond to incentives. And if your incentive is to back the U.S. dollar, then that's what you'll do. But if your incentive, if you've got nothing to lose, then you'd probably go with Bitcoin, you know, because that's the underdog, because the your incentives are pushing you to do that. I, I remember one of the, one of the first episodes I did. I don't remember what episode it is, but they had an economist on there, and I looked him up. I forget the guy's name, but I looked him up, and he won a Nobel Peace Prize for economics. Of course, he's a total lefty, and he was sitting there talking about how Bitcoin was a big scam and a big bubble, and this was like just before like it hit the moon. Like this was like back in like November. This came out, and he's on Bloomberg Television. Right with the anchor who talks about the market all the time. This is this this fat guy wearing a tie. He talks about the markets and the stock markets and forex markets all the time, every single day on Bloomberg Television. And he turns to a Nobel Prize winning economist, who by the way is like a total lefty, and says to him that quote referring to people uh, investing in Bitcoin, quote, these people are relying on a Marxist theory of value, end quote. (laughs) And at that point, like, my brain exploded. Like, my head just popped off the top of my body. And, And I realized these guys are just guessing. They don't know anything. Yeah. Like, well, those ones, th- those ones I, don't like. like that, that's kind of what I was getting at before. That there's people like that that literally know nothing uh, and are just guessing at everything in life, and other ones that are guessing, but at least their guesses are somewhat educated because they've at least studied it. But they know <laughs> so much. You have a Nobel Prize winning economist well, that's standing just, next that's, to a a, no, a, Nobel a Prize. career market analyst. This is a guy that's been analyzing the market his entire life, and for him to say something like that oh. is just like. Like, there's so much. This is the knowledge problem. This is the knowledge problem that Mises pointed out to us way back when. This is the knowledge problem in practice. There's just so much information out there that the I, the, the likelihood of you being correct about something is is actually impossible. <laughs> It's a good point, though, and it's funny. He said that when in the 30s or 40s, and <laughs> and uh, look how not only how much more information there is since then, but how much more of it is readily available to every individual. So people, you know, again, think they can know everything, and even the ones who tr- like you said, well, even the ones who try will fail because you can't, you can't even come close. Listen, so- socialists couldn't even uh, manage a small family living on a desert island like Robinson Crusoe style. Like socialism could not do it. Like there is no size of population that y- you could manage top down like that. I'm perfectly- you know, the only reason it. The only reason it works in a corporation, the only reason it works like in a business, like with a boss and a manager and so on and so forth, is because it's voluntary. Because you can walk out or walk back in whenever you want. You know? So, again, well, if it's you just walk out, guessing. If you walk out, there's a pretty good chance you're not going to be able to walk back in. But, you know, you'll see. <laughs> right. But, I mean, you can I walk you out mean. and walk back into I, a different business. I, 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 know what you, I know what you meant. I was just busting chops. No, I mean, I'm, I, 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 I think that I think historically that's kind of been proven out time and time and time again. Although I'm not opposed to people continuing to try it as long as they leave everybody else the fuck alone. I really don't care. You know, I'm a, I'm a big proponent and have been for a very long time of, you know, like I said, I, I let go of the dream 
dream of seeing it. But if it were to happen in my lifetime, I'm a huge fan of the idea of panarchy mm-hmm. and everybody having their own little communities and their own, you know, whether they're covenant communities, whatever the hell you want to yeah. call them, everybody having their own little sections, their own little uh, set of rules that people agree to voluntarily to live under. And then you guys rock it. And then to just actually especially just if you you know tie it down to let's just say just say the united states if it was able to be accomplished in the united states and like there'd be tens th- tens of thousands or however many communities spread out all over the place you would actually finally have what was what was promised under you know the whole the whole con of the constitution the idea of the uh, yeah. the, the laboratories all the laboratories that could work uh you know could work out their own problems and figure out which system works best by leaving each other the fuck alone like we we would actually actually finally be able to that, have that was that. probably like the biggest push forward for western civilization is like I, I think what worked about the united states probably had very little to do with the constitution probably had very little to do with freedom and probably had a lot more to do with the fact that you had a homogenous culture that existed within different separate states that had all their different rules that they were able to uh hash out which works better and which doesn't you know, it made the guessing more effective, if you will. I mean, yeah. like, I mean, I just think of like the entire world's population as like, like a random number generator that's trying to translate encrypted information. That that's all it's doing. It's just guessing a bunch of random numbers, and and the more the more you can can I I don't want to say separate people because that, that's kind of like a, a bad way, but but the more you can restore sovereignty toward towards the individual, it basically it increases the hash rate. Think about it. if anybody is into crypto mining, they know what I'm talking about. But <laughs> you increase the hash rate. <laughs> You increase the hash rate, the more you uh, separate people uh, from interfering with each other through uh, force. Great point. And on that note, uh, I'm just looking at the time. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to go. I mean, I don't know how much time you have, but I don't want to go too much longer because uh, these. Uh, while I do want to start doing interviews and stuff like this and have one-on-one conversations, I I need to kind of ease my audience into it because these have always been historically like 15 minutes to 30 minute episodes. <laughs> but before, well, I appreciate you putting up with me. Oh no, no, this has been a great conversation. I actually, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to stop. But I was just, I was looking at the time, like, all right, I got to do the edit and stuff like that. But I mean, we can keep talking afterwards if you want. Like I said, this this will probably come out somewhere else later on. Sure. But before before. Before we get going, uh, only because I did I did reference it twice earlier, and I, I hate to leave loose ends hanging. Uh, another thing Mike, Michael Dean has beaten into my head over the years of being on radio is uh, the, the thing about the, the Israeli thing earlier on that you brought up. Oh, and, uh, yeah. The reason you got kicked out. I, I mean, we can go into a little for, for a little bit if you want, uh, if, if you can. But uh, I was just curious, uh, you, you know, you mentioned one of the reasons you got kicked out of one of the groups, of one of the ANCAP groups was saying that you had uh, certain sympathies towards Israel or you could see sympathies. Uh, yeah. What yeah. uh what what exactly what exactly were those cuz I, I was just curious about that. Oh, well, it ha- it had to do with it, it was during like a, a Hamas attack and and uh it was a very small rocket attack. It wasn't anything like very newsworthy, but a lot of people in the ANCAP community were expressing pro-Palestinian sentiments and I was just kind of making the case. And I might be kind of biased because there's Jewish people in my family. But I was kind of making the case that I thought that Israel probably has a stronger property claim, or the Israeli people probably have a stronger property claim than the Palestinians. And I based my uh, argument on, uh, I, I think I had three major arguments for it, but my first one is that the problem with property claims is that we kind of fall into this black and white pattern of there's legitimate property property claims and there's illegitimate property claims. And while in the realm of morality, that may be true, but once you cross the nap mirror into the gray world that we can't possibly have all the information to sort out, um, what you actually have is you have property claims that are either stronger or weaker than other property claims. That's the reality. There's just this gradiating scale of property claims, and you got to figure out where they fall. Like, is this a stronger or a weaker property claim than the opposing property claim? And so there was a PragerU video uh, that came out that talked about how after World War II and even a couple of years before it, especially when there was that 
organized sort of socialized farming that was happening in Russia, a lot of Jews escaped from Russia and they went to Israel. This was after World War II. I'm sorry. But they escaped to Israel and what they started doing was in this PragerU video, he talked about it, how they drained the swamps and got rid of malaria and how they leached the salt out of the ground and how they terraced the foothills and they basically turned what was a desert, pretty much a desert, into a huge food producing nation in the Middle East, uh, a place that doesn't produce a lot of food because it's mostly sand. So they were able to turn this desert into a green place. And so while I'm not a Lockean, there is that aspect of my identity that comes from Locke that says, well, you know, that that adds to the strength of their property claim. Well, that, yeah, that, adds, then the, that adds the homesteading aspect to it. So, yeah. <laughs> right. And, and, and then the other thing that added aspects uh, to it is that after the state of Israel was established, what happened is you had a whole bunch of Middle Eastern countries, including Palestine, including Egypt, including Syria and Lebanon, all attacked Israel at once. And Israel defended itself successfully, albeit with the help of, uh, you know, some arms from America and stuff, you know, but they were able to fight. They, they spilt their own, own, own blood on their land, you know, so now you have blood and soil combined uh -oh. making a strong property claim, there's gonna, there's gonna you know, be some, and, and I understand that phrase has negative, <laughs> I understand that phrase has negative connotations, but like the two things that can make your a really strong property claim is one soil, mixing your labor with the land and producing value. That soil, and then the other one is defending that land against aggressors. Those 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 Muslims were initiating force. That's a clear violation of the non-aggression principle. And according to my philosophy, the Jewish people had every right to act in self-defense, and they spilt blood to do so. So that is the other thing that makes their property claims strong. Blood and soil in combination, and this is kind of the alt-writer in me, but blood and soil in combination is, is a recipe for a very strong property claim that doesn't make your property claim legitimate, or you know, but we don't live in the black and white world of morality. We live in the real world of aesthetics where things are gray. And so that the blood and soil property claim is a stronger property claim than the Palestinian one, which was a claim of aggression and, uh, uh, you know, of violence. And now I don't think that everything that Israel does is good. I think Israel is a government and all governments are bad and all governments are illegitimate. This is true. But compared to the Palestinians, I think that they're in the right. I really do. And you can't tell me that somebody is committing a crime when they go build a settlement on otherwise unoccupied land, right? Which is the issue we have now versus Israel and Palestine, you know, is that they're pushing back. They, well, they've been pushing back for a very long time against Jewish settlements, you know, well, <laughs> you know, building a settlement is not theft, you know, so I just have a very hard time having sympathies towards Palestinians because they lost their land. Well, if you if you didn't want to lose your land, maybe you shouldn't have attacked them in the first place. I mean, there's consequences to to attacking somebody. You know, you lose. That's the risk you take, and you took that risk voluntarily. With that, and if and if that makes me a shill for Israel, I guess that's what I am. I, I I don't know. I, I don't think I would go that far. I <laughs> I, I I don't know, man. I I don't. I mean, I is not one of my strongest sub subjects. I mean, the the points that you're making, just in in general. I mean, I obviously do agree with them. You know, as far as be having a, a strong, you know, stronger claims versus weaker claims, rather than like these absolute claims that are like this is like you know definitively mine. Well, yeah, you're right. right. There, I think I think there absolutely is more more realistically. You're right. I think you're absolutely right. That there's a stronger and not. And as far as like you know homesteading, I'm a big fan of the whole print the idea of that. So I I can see how that would work in that situation. I think. At least from my understanding, and uh, from what you know, the, the the bulk of the information that I've picked up, especially in the past couple of years, about this is from people like you know, I, I listen to a lot of Scott Horton, and he gives me a lot of information about stuff like this, and and, and my buddy, uh, my good buddy Merrick Van Landingham, who runs the Radical Logic podcast, 
which is currently on hiatus. He keeps promising it's coming back, but we'll see. Uh, but anyway, they're very knowledgeable about this area. And it just, it, you know, it, from what from what I've been able to glean from it, it just seems that at the time, if you're going to look at it from that perspective, well, maybe the Palestinians did have a stronger claim at the time. I don't know. You know, attacking people, yeah, I, I, have, I have a big problem with that. But then for me... Like I just look at it with what's going on right now, and I think it just it just suck it just sucks all around. It's just horrible because you know there are there are a whole yeah, bunch well, of people that, to, are, that are suffering in the guy you know the, the the Palestinians that are stuck that are kind of they're literally kind of trapped in the Gaza Strip. Yeah. So what what happened originally is that you had a um, in Palestine um, you you had a British uh, colonial government uh, that basically what they did was they were double spending the land. Uh, which means that they would simultaneously sell a piece of land to a Jew and to a Palestinian uh, at the same time. So, I mean, uh, they were doing things like that. It's all the fucking British uh, fault. I I knew it, man. It all goes back to that. Right, yeah. Uh, So, I mean, there were real injustices perpetuated upon the Palestinians, and, and let's make no mistake about it. And there was, you know, yeah, so, I mean... The Palestinians had had just uh, grievances, you know, but in the end, though, they're after everything has been sorted out, their claim just isn't as strong as the the Jewish claim at this point in time. And I know the Jewish claim kind of the claim that they're making rests on the Bible and, and historical religious texts. And I think that's wrong. I think that the past um, the past 100 years of just Jewish uh, settlements is a far better claim than any religious nonsense. And I think that Israel is wrong for resting their claim on that. They're making a bad argument. And if they were in the court of Ankapistan as a legal consultant uh, <laughs> for a independent arbitration service, <laughs> right? I would probably advise them to make a different argument. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that's uh, I, I I see your point. Yeah, well, like I said, I I'm not I'm not near knowledgeable enough to actually have a, a, a you know a standpoint either way. I, I just I, I was really curious to know what your position was. And like I said, you know, based on I mean, honestly, I don't even like Jews that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know. They're kind of annoying. <laughs> uh, I'll make sure to make but that the bump of the show. Yeah, no. yeah but I just I just got to say that the idea of having a homeland, I mean, is is really really important. I I can't I cannot deny to deny them that. I mean, I mean, you could say, "Oh, well, the Palestinians deserve a homeland too." Yeah, but you know, like half the world is a Muslim country. You know, you know what I mean? Like, there's no shortage of places for Muslims to go where they can feel at home and, and, and share a culture and share a language well, and share the same halal. That's not, that's not, that's not, know, that's not, that's not entirely true because just like any other religion, there's so many different sects that, you know, I mean, just look at the the, the Sunnis and the Shias. I, I'm only aware of two. <laughs> uh, there, oh, there's there's a bunch of them, man. There's so many. I mean, the, the Sunnis and the Shias, and then you have the, uh, you know, what's the one that's in Saudi Arabia? The, the real hardliners, the psycho ones, the ones that actually are going out and committing the Wahhabists. The, the Wahhabists. Yeah, the Wahhabists. That's it. Thank you. You know, that's but just, those still, are the main three. Still, um, they're, those are the main three. They're still three. Sunnis, right? Uh, I don't even know. Well, I don't think the Sunnis want to want to claim them anymore. <laughs> or at least most of the Sunnis don't. Wait, wait, which was the one in Iran? Is that Shiite or Sunni? I think they're the Shias in Iran. Um, but I'm never, I, I don't, the again, Shias. Okay. I, I, so the, I think. But again, I don't, I don't, I don't pay attention. So the Wahhabists are Sunnis. That, that it might it might be it might be true, but again, they're, they're the ones I know that are, again, uh, yeah. all the stuff that I've I've researched, they are the ones that are responsible for most of the horrible shit that happens. Um, but that's a, that's a whole other conversation. I don't even want to go down that road. Um, like I said, I was just I was just curious to know, and and it's, I mean it's interesting. I mean, like I said, if it, I, I think I, I totally agree with you too that I, I think if you're going to make a claim, even even in this day and age, even before we get to like Ankapistan, you're much better off going the property route. Of, uh, the property rights route than going the uh, magical document that, uh, route. Um, I think. Yeah, yeah, and then once you go the blood route after that, that pretty much solidifies it. Well, it will. Well, I mean, it, it has largely in the eyes of you know the the people who rule the world, right? The, the country, the the countries that gave them the okay for all this shit and continue to back them up for this shit, like the USA. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> actually, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of pushback against Israel. A lot. Of, a lot of EU members do not like uh, uh, the Jewish state and would like to see it disappear. 
Wow. And, and and one of the reasons, I got to admit, one of the reasons I'm pro-Israel isn't even because uh, I necessarily like the state of Israel, but it's because a lot of my political en enemies don't. And so I find it convenient to be pro-Israel. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, if, if a, a lot of commies uh, seem to be, you know, pro-Muslim, so, you know, uh, that's what I'm against, you know, because I don't know which one is right. How am I supposed to know? So I'm just going... <laughs> Uh, just going where it's convenient because I'm just guessing like everybody else. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, on that note, I think we should get wrapping up. But uh, Ryan, thank you very much. This, this really has been a great conversation. I'm uh, I'm really glad that you reached out to me, and uh, I hope uh, I hope we could do this again in the future too. It's been interesting getting to know you, and I think uh, while we do definitely, I think I'm walking away from this, you know, still thinking we have some differences here, and we didn't even, we didn't even, we only, we only touched on some of them. But I, I you know, like uh -huh. I said originally, this is why I want to do this. I want to have conversations. I, I don't want to be stuck in an echo chamber. I don't want to just keep talking to people that I keep going. Oh yes, yes. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I know I agreed with you a lot in this, but I was actually surprised. I thought I would be disagreeing with you a lot more. But a lot of the points you made, mm -hmm. uh, I, I were well, uh, well thought out, and I, I think. Uh, you definitely, you definitely gave some, me some more things to think about, but, uh, you know, like I said, even, even a walking away, I'm still like, yeah, I still disagree with you a lot. I, I think it was a wonderful conversation. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what I want to have happen. I want to continue to have conversations like this because I think even, even people who have jumped over to our side of the fence, you know, the, the, the collect, the collective, we of the anarchists, you know, no matter what stripe you want to put yourself under, like I said earlier, I think too many of us get. Com get complacent with the, with this new ideology and then think you have all the answers and like you've pointed out so many times no matter what we're all still fucking guessing so guess what you may be right but what does it really hurt to uh you know take a look at some other ideas and just feel them out and even if even if it's just to be able to completely destroy them officially you know you still have you know what was what's that it's the it's an aristotle quote right the the mark of a educated mind is uh to be able to uh to, to look uh, i'm paraphrasing to entertain an idea yeah, entertain. I, was, I was stumbling over the word entertain i'm like i'm like what the hell is that word that goes there i know yeah, yeah. Uh, without accepting it yeah i think that's I, I think that's very very great advice i wish more people would take it i didn't take it for a very long time and i keep trying to remind myself of it regularly Early, that I have to, and I have to keep an open mind to to a lot more things because I really don't know shit, and uh, I wish more people would admit that too. But uh, so once again, before we get going, please uh, please plug away. Yeah, I just want to say really quick, Jeremy, that I really appreciate the opportunity uh, for you to speak with me. Uh, I'm definitely a fan of yours, and uh, so thank you so much. I'm super appreciative. Uh, the, the other thing I'm appreciative about though, is that a lot of my ideas, again, it sort of exists in this gray smoky area, right? And it's not until that I've got another live person to bounce ideas off of somebody that I disagree with, you know, that I can bring those ideas back to this side of the mirror and make them solid for the first time uh, on an audio recording. And you've done that for me, and I just want to uh, thank you again for that. Again, my name is Ryan, a.k.a. The Wasp. You can listen to all my shows at thewaspreport.com. I'm also on iTunes, TuneIn, and Stitcher Radio. I'm selling t-shirts, teespring.com slash thewaspreport. Also, you can donate to my Bitcoin wallet. It's on my website. And again, you know, thanks for the opportunity, Jeremy. Oh, you're quite welcome, and I will. I will obviously put all the all, a bunch of those re relevant links in the show notes for you fine folks. So once again, thank you for the conversation, Ryan. Thank you everybody for listening. This has been Abolitionist Abstractions. Uh, most of my content can be found at solpodcast.org. Although we uh, we, we are SOL, Steve's Liberty, we are back on Steemit again, and I'm finally on Steemit. Um, that's actually something we started to mention earlier uh, before we started recording that I thought maybe we'd get into, but I, I, we ran out of time. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, after after a year and a half of poo pooing Steemit, and you know, I was one of those original guys who said, "Oh, it's a scam. It's not going to last." And really? I, I kind of forgot about it for a while. Yeah, because we started a, we started it way back in uh, around episode seventy for us, so that was. Sometime early in 2016, and we just yeah. kind of forgot about it. We I, I still need it. to be deeply educated on Steam it because, well, like, I literally just discovered. If it we today. have, some, if, I don't know if, anything. If you about have, it. if you have time, we can talk about it after uh, after we close out here. Yeah, but, definitely. But yeah, so uh, so the Seas of Liberty is back up on Steam, and I am now on Steam it at Abolitionist J. Uh, if you are a Steamian, please go check my stuff out, and please consider giving me some upvotes and re-steaming my stuff, man. Just trying to look to 
to uh, aside, actually aside from getting other revenue streams i'm kind of psyched because now they have launched uh, well they i guess it was a couple months ago but it's finally starting to get more in full swing uh they they launched dtube which is uh, their competitor for youtube it's de- it's decentralized it's on the blockchain there's they still got some bugs to work out but when it, when it's working right the U- the upload speeds are so much faster and your stuff is there permanently it cannot be taken down you don't have to wow. worry about the bullshit of people and your monetization that's cannot- the way the internet should be. And your monetization cannot be taken away from you, as has happened to so many people I know, including us temporarily. Uh, the Seeds of Liberty on oh YouTube, gosh. we had a, we were demonetized temporarily. We fi- we got that sorted out. We finally got back up and running again. Um, although we don't generate much from YouTube, we've actually generated more from our first hardcore week of posting on Steam it again in in a year or so than we have in the past couple of months on YouTube. So YouTube can kiss my ass. So anyway, so I post a lot of my stuff there <laughs> and uh, those notes will obvi- those uh, links will obviously be in the show notes too. So once again, this has been Abolitionist Abstractions. Thank you everybody for listening and we'll catch you next time. Peace, love, voluntary interactions for all.